this vision, which is to create a community where all residents, including black and other people of color, have access to the funding, education, training, coaching, and other resources necessary to have affordable home ownership opportunities, stable employment, and successful businesses and entrepreneur opportunities. Basically, um, we are interested in closing the equity gap. And I think one thing that our previous presenter helps to illustrate is COVID really revealed disparities that we either didn't know existed and they created additional disparities, you know, that, no, that most communities, especially, particularly small communities, just aren't equipped to manage. So I think that's, that's another reason why we're here. And I was very fortunate during COVID to meet my partner in crime, Rebecca Flora, who is also... We're the R board, Times 2 gang. We're the R, you know, the R Times 2, <laughs> um, who is also an economic development consultant, and we have very complementary skills and experiences and similar interests and a desire to, for lack of a better term, kind of bloom where we're planted, you know, and to really contribute to the community in a meaningful way and to share the expertise that we have gained over the last probably 30 years between us. We yeah. also have conscripted our friend Sam Shoge over here, who was an early listener and thought partner as I thought this through and as we have thought this through. He's been invaluable because his expertise, you know, having sat where you all sit, ha has, he has an understanding of the community and certainly as a native that, I, that neither one of us has. So... I don't know. That, I mean, I think we have just been really lucky, and we've worked very, very hard over the last eight months to get to the place where we are now. And the example that the Coalition for the Homeless raised and this sort of notion of high touch, you know, I think one of the things that can be very challenging working in communities where there are trust issues is repeated contact. It's not enough to say, here's the link to the website to fill out the piece of paper. We're going to have a meeting at 6 o'clock. We'll have child care. We'll have dinner. And we will walk you through the process. If you want to start a nonprofit, if you want to start a small business, you know, we, will be, we, would, we would like to be the people who, or we intend to be the people who facilitate that. That's kind of the other piece of what it is that we hope to do. Because we do think that, for a whole series of reasons, that seems to be a very effective way to work, especially when you are in small, diverse communities and when people are kind of far flung. So you have likely seen the news that uh, I will be stepping down from the Kent County Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and what I'll be doing um, to replace that is very much so this. Uh, this is the type of work that is just genuinely exciting. Um, economic and community development and really solving these macro level problems uh, and getting to a point where we can just really sink our teeth into them. Uh, that's something that's really exciting and um, uh, I've been talking with Rebecca about this very concept for years now. Uh, so the point that, or the fact that we have finally gotten it to a point where we can actually come before the mayor and council, uh, present the, the full vision, the full concept, um, and truly bring you up to speed and, and, and um, you know, truly make you aware and, and hopefully buy into this vision. So the first thing is this whole issue of data. Um, last fall when we were all working together, I thought this was going to be easy, quite honestly, having worked, while I grew up in a rural area, most of my work has been in urban cities, right? So I thought this would be easy. I started digging and found, found out that the breakdown, the racial breakdown by county isn't obvious, it's not easy to find, and quite frankly, no one that, tell me if someone else otherwise, I'm not finding it. So that was my first step of my own surficial look. Um, the second step was to see, hey, we've got a new census data coming out, what is that showing me? Went into that, found this quick facts source, downloaded that, because I'm pretty good at Excel spreadsheets, and imported that data, put it together, Still, no breakdown. Um, it wasn't there. And so I actually teamed up with someone that Rebecca gave me a, a name through, with, with Chesapeake College, who we are partnering with in this whole initiative. Um, he doesn't really do this part day by day, but he sort of knows data. Um, and he ultimately kind of peer reviewed and said, yeah, you're right. 
and then put me in touch with the Maryland Department of Planning. We had a couple of really good calls with them. They actually offered to help in terms of pointing us to, well, where do you find those resources even? Do they even exist? And so they responded to my spreadsheet with another column, but there's still more work to be done. So at that point, Sam, because he's the guy on the ground, Sam? local knowledge, said, hey, have you heard about the, um, the whole Delmarva Index? And yep. what do you know about the Delmarva Index? I'm going to let Sam, here, we'll so, switch places. Uh, thanks. Here we go. Um, that I approached this, uh, this group, the, the regional GIS cooperative, and said, hey, is there a way that you can aggregate all of these data platforms so as economic developers, we don't have to keep going to a wide variety of sources to get the information that we need to do our jobs? And they said, well, like you should, should ask. We're working on this very thing, which is the Delmarva Index, and I highly encourage you all to uh, take a look at this. They have broken down uh, the eastern shore in a variety of different data sets. Uh, jobs, housing, transportation, um, largest industries in each county, and you can filter it all. It's, it's really phenomenal. Um, but the problem now that we're running into is even though that those data sets exist and they're, they're, they're combined into one source, uh, we're still running in, into issues of equity. Uh, all of that data is not broken out by race which is really important, especially in light of COVID-19, how you know it did not affect each community the same. And there's really no way of breaking out that information further. Um, so naturally, once we realized that this gap existed, and considering my experience with the, the Eastern Shore Regional GIS Cooperative, uh, approaching them was the very first thing that I did. And uh, they are going to, uh, I think, be really fantastic partners to again, bring this information to bear and shed some light on it, so. I have 20 plus years of experience in philanthropy, so I have the relationships and the understanding having sat really, like as I like to say, on both sides of the table as the funder and as the applicant and having guided people through that. I can say very confidently that meeting a need, especially post-COVID, being able to demonstrate a partnership with not just community organizations, but with the government entities who clearly have the will, but not necessarily the human or fiscal resources, is generally a very attractive thing for funders. And it's especially true that as you look at the Eastern Shore, these resources just don't exist. So providing, you know, mm -hmm. at being a locus for creating that is very compelling, not just to us. The notion of community is so important, and it really is for us, community and partnership is really our through line, because it's, it's easier, I think, for people to sometimes determine on their own what they believe a community needs. Here's what we think you need, and here's what we'd like to provide. But it doesn't always work. You know, I think the most effective way to organize and have community change is through community engagement and outreach and building trust and partnerships so that everybody in a community feels equally invested and has not just a seat at the table, but the opportunity to make decisions and to make an impact. Thinking about, you know, really to the point that the questions that were raised in January about fund development and aren't we all sort of feeding from the same bowl, we thought it would be helpful to set, really to sort of talk about, to level set what a typical fund development approach is. And in general, you know, small to mid-sized organizations have smaller staffs, limited time, and they don't necessarily have the expertise to do their own fundraising. And you know, in small communities, you have transitions with boards and staffs, and so you don't get to a consistency organizationally where you're able to build a fund development strategy and a track record and the ability to actually get the res to resources that you need over a time horizon. Because what often happens is typically fund development in small to mid-sized nonprofits tends to be reactive rather than proactive you know, we have this need we need to fill. And you end up in a lot of cases with what I, what I think nonprofits suffer from sometimes is mission creep. 
you know, we're going to do this because there's money available to pay for it. And if we do this, that will allow us to fund a portion of our operating, even though the thing that we are going to do, we don't really know how to do. Mm -hmm. And much of the work that I do in my practice is helping organizations build capacity through collaboration. So rather than doing, taking on something you don't know how to do, partner with somebody who already does it, you know, really in the same way that we came together as a group with synergistic expertise, it's the same theory for nonprofit organizations. And generally speaking, the common result when you have fund develop, when you under the sort of typical fund development strategy is the big get bigger, the small stay small, or they close. And you don't get, you don't take advantage of all the opportunities, you don't have the same impact, and I don't want to get, you know, too deep into this because we have lots to cover, but you end up in a fairly reactive place where needs are not met.